In this video, we're gonna be continuing on with our weather derivative series and specifically looking at ways that we can actually model the temperature volatility. Now, we have a modified ullenstein ullenbeck process um, that we've actually defined the parameters for in previous videos, and now we're trying to specify models for our time varying volatility parameter. Now, if you can remember from last time, using our model, we created this simulation um, across a number of periods where T is our real temperature, and then this line, uh, yellow line, is the model. So our model is now capturing those average temperatures um, throughout the periods. However, we need to capture um, that difference in volatility between seasons. So we have a number of ways of doing that. We have uh, piecewise constant functions. So this is where we can try and capture the volatility for each specific season, say months. We've got parametric regression polynomial. We've got non-parametric regression like splines. We've got Fourier series to model the volatility of temperature and we've got stochastic differential equations. So uh, let's get into it and we'll first look at the piecewise constant functions. Just a reminder that we've got temperature data going all the way back to 1860, all the way through to today for Sydney. So what we can do is we can get the unbiased estimator um, for the quadratic uh, variation of this temperature process, and that's just gonna be the standard deviation of this process. So I've done this for each day, and that's the line in blue. I've then shown with reference to the mean temperature what the percentage volatility is here in orange. And as you can see, as we progress throughout the year, uh, this value has changed. So what we really want is we want models to try and um, given a day in the year or a specific period, we want to be able to model this volatility, this standard deviation that we have in blue. Again, our summary of our modified um, ornstein ullenbeck process is that we've got this modified um, dynamics here where we've defined the mean reversion parameter. We have our change in daily average temperature, uh, T bar, and then we've got the first derivative which is captured here, hence the modified OU dynamics. Now we want to actually define what this volatility parameter sigma uh, that's varying with time is. So the volatility of the temperature process, like I've just said, um, the estimator is based on the quadratic variation of this temperature process, and that's our, our best estimate is uh, the standard deviation or the bias standard deviation of this process. So our volatility is a dynamic volatility of this temperature process, and this could be seasonal, daily, monthly, etc. So if we first take a look and we just group on the day, again we get that blue line and I've just plotted standard deviation on the left hand side with days uh, 366 to include the leap years there. Now let's look at the first method for modeling this. So we've got piecewise constant functions. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna come up with two data frames. So I'm going to group on day and get the standard deviation, then I'm gonna group on month and, and get the standard deviation. I'm then going to add these two data frames together and plot that in a row. And here you can see that in uh, the orange, I have that standard deviation um, for all the days um, over our time period from 1860. Um, all the way through to today. And then we've got the standard deviation of uh, the different periods in terms of months. So January, February, March, etc., And that's there in blue. So as you can see, this is what you would call a piecewise constant function. We could fit this and make it non-constant, but I left this as the simplest option for now. We are capturing that seasonality, um, that volatility has for temperature. Now, parametric regression, we have a number of options, but here we're gonna look at fitting polynomials. For this, I'm going to be using uh, the Stats Models API and then Skylearn pre-processing polynomial features. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to set and initialize my degrees of freedom. I'm gonna go um, and test polynomials with order three to seven. I'm going to fit my or transform our original data. Um, and then I'm going to fit using ordinary least squares. 
Once I've done that, I can predict using my original data and fit the model and I'll show you the plots here. So by looking at this graph, we can actually see that um, there are some models that have been very overfitted and some that have potentially underfitted. Underfitted, for example, the three degree model in red doesn't really capture some of these dynamics um, during the low points in the season and doesn't capture this high point um, in the season during summer. Whereas we've got some overfitting here with the higher degree polynomials, maybe six and seven, where we're completely misrepresenting the first part of the year. So how are we gonna get the best fit um, in a parsonomous way? And what I mean by that is with the least number of degrees of freedom. Well, we can use the Achaic information criterion, the AIC criterion, to judge the parsonomy between model fit and complexity. So all I need to do is that because I've used the um, OLS module using the stats models, I can just print out um, the AIC criterion. And of course, we want to go for the lowest AIC, uh, which is parsonomous. So here I'm going to pick um, the order, the fifth order polynomial. And obviously in the graph, we can see that that fits quite well. If we then print that out more explicitly, you can see that Here's our polynomial fit with um, five, uh, fifth order polynomial in the red, and that fits our volatility nicely. Now let's take a look at another methodology, and this is the local and non-parametric regression. So here we can use spline. So interpolation is a method of estimating unknown data points in a given range. Spline interpolation is a type of piecewise polynomial interpolation method. So spline interpolation is a useful method in smoothing the curve of surface data. Now, a B-spline curve fitting specifically, or basis spline, is a curve approximation method that requires parameters such as knots, spline coefficients, and degree of the spline. So to construct a smoother spline fit, we need to specify the number of knots. And this is the number of knots within our given data set that we're actually defining um, to smooth out our curve. So knots are the joints on the polynomial segments and we get to define the number of them that they are. So the steps in B-spline curve fitting is that based on the knots number that we define, we'll determine the new X data vector by using the quantile function. Then we'll be using the SPL rep function and it returns a tuple containing the vector of, you guessed it, the parameters that we need, knots, spline coefficients, and the degree of the spline. So then we're gonna use the B spline class to construct spline fit on this X vector data. So from SciPy, we're going to import interpolate and we're going to use our data of um, the temperature volatility and the standard deviation over those uh, days in the year. We're going to first off just define the knot number as five to show you how this works. We're then going to find the new quartile representation of this number and then we're going to pass that through into our SPL rep function in SciPy interpolate. That gives us back the tuple of which we get the knot number, um, we get the coefficients, and then we get the uh, degrees um, of complexity of the B-spline. So then now we can fit this B-spline model using that tuple um, that we've just said with our original data set. And what you get is uh, essentially a spline fit as we have here in red. So this is with a, a five number of knots, but what happens when we want to test different number of knots, aka adding complexity to our model? Well, now I can define a spline function when um, I've actually defined my number of knots. The reason that we have plus two here is because you always have two knots at the uh, start and the end of your data series. So here we've um, just getting our Y fit for each different interpolation with the number of knots given. So here the number of knots I'm testing is three, 10, 20, 30, 50, and 80, and I'm going to plot those out. Now, the other number I've plotted here is uh, the residual sum of squares, the mean squared error, um, which here is really an indicative of fit. And although this RSS goes down as we increase the complexity and knots, what you can see is an incredible amount of overfitting as we start getting down to, uh, well, up to a number of 80. So you can see an incredible amount of overfitting to reduce that RSS Whereas we're looking for something quite parsonomous. So 
really you, you, you could be using some kind of metric to, to judge parsonomy with the number of knots being like a number, a, a parameter, and you could use that as a penalty, and then you could use RRS as um, a measure of fit. You could define any, any uh, equation you want to try and find a parsonomous model, but in this case, I might go um, with number with 10 knots, and I think that looks like a good fit. Even three has done as good a job as our polynomial nearly. Now let's explore using Fourier series to model the volatility of temperature. So here a Fourier series, we've got these coefficients in front of our cosine and sine functions. And the uh, cos and sine functions have different orders of magnitude and really it's, um, can be an infinite sum, but we're actually going to sum uppercase i here, and that defines the order of the Fourier series. So here, we've got the sum of all these cosine functions and sine functions, and we wanna estimate the parameters that give the best fit to our model. So first off, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at long-term volatility. So here I'm going to take the rolling 30-day standard deviation. So that means that we get a standard deviation for every 30, uh, for every day, but it's the rolling 30-day standard deviation. So here I can see that we have um, quite a solid mean that's really centered around our data. So I'm quite happy with using a Fourier series just off, off this um, with no linear trend if there was a linear trend here present in volatility, then I could add that here uh, instead of just having a coefficient for my volatility at the front of my Fourier series. Now, the way I'm going to test different Fourier series and try and fit by least squares is I'm going to use this SimFit module in Python that's been written. So pip install simfit, um, go look at the documentation, but essentially what we can do is we can pass a dictionary of um, symbolic Fourier series. And what I mean by that is that we can create a dictionary, and I've printed out one here, where we have our coefficients that we're interested in and the particular model that's passed through for optimization. Now here, this is a, a third order model. So I've passed in um, th uh, third order. I've defined my frequency because we know that the data is, the frequency is yearly. We've experienced that in our temperature, so I'm happy to then um, redefine that frequency here again. So that's two times pi uh, divided by the 365.25 days. And remember, because we're dealing with such a large amount of data, number of years, we have to account for that extra day in year leap years. What we're gonna do is we're gonna test Fourier orders all the way from one through to 10 uh, using the range function, and we're going to look at the residual sum of squares. And what we can see is that the residual sum of squares really decreases until about order three, but even, even we get slight performance increase as we go to six. So here I've just used the model six, and then we've I've fit the parameters uh, using this um, SimFit module. And then what I can do is I can print out the Fourier series that have resulted in the best fit. And I believe it uses least squares uh, to find these parameters. What that looks like, essentially I've just plotted the last uh, 20 something years worth of data, 25 years worth of data. And you can see here that we've got that black line, which is our Fourier series composition, um, fifth order Fourier series that we've then repeated every year to try and capture that volatility. And if we look at that more granularly, just at a one year basis, we've essentially got this blue line that's replicated from year to year in our Fourier series. Now this is quite handy because the way that this works is that I can take time actually as the ordinal number starting from the first ordinal number the same way we have for our temperature series defined. So this is a quite handy way where we can use the same indexing in terms of time um, for both defining the volatility and then our temperature stochastic model that we had from previous videos. So I, I'm, I'm really liking this version so far. Now, last but not least, we have stochastic differential equation. And now what I mean by that is we originally had this modified um, Einstein-Ullenbeck process, and uh, that's of this form here. 
But now I actually want to define um, our uh, volatility or the change in volatility by nearly the same equation. I'm going to take that ernstein ullenbeck process and we're going to start defining parameters. Now the handy thing about this is that um, we've already discovered that this long-term volatility isn't time varying. So really, if I, uh, sorry, the big change here is that I'm gonna chop up this data now and look at standard deviation on a month-to-month -month basis. So just like with our uh, constant uh, piecewise function that was on a month-to-month -month basis, now I'm looking at monthly volatility. So if we aggregate on the months um, of our observed daily average temperature, we get this uh, standard deviation path. And I've just re-indexed the time periods there, zero being from January um, 1959, I think. Oh, 1859, sorry. So we've got this average uh, standard deviation, and that means that this parameter here in our SDE is not going to be time varying. Now, that is a hidden gem because what it means is that we can actually create our modified ullenstein ullenbeck process like we had before, where we used the derivative of um, our variable of interest, our uh, time varying parameter, and that means that we'll be able to use uh, the same methodology to estimate our rate of mean reversion as we did in the previous video. Now we were able to auto regress on our, uh, our temperature parameter to then our residual of the temperature parameter to find this rate of mean reversion. And here we're going to be doing the same thing with our volatility term to find our rate of mean reversion. But before then we need to find this fixed parameter that isn't going to be moving with time. We're going to set it as, um, as the overall process, the volatility of volatility. So of course the unbiased estimate of volatility is going to be the same for the quadratic variation process. So here we're going to take our standard deviations and we're going to get the standard deviation of the temperature standard deviation, which sounds funny, but uh, that's what we're going to define it as. That uh, parameter that we've, we're estimating is gamma in our model. So I've said that gamma is 0.58. And it's remember, it's important to understand that time is now on a monthly frequency in this sub SDE. So just like the previous um, video, we're actually going to calculate this rate of mean reversion um, by using a lag process. We can do that because uh, the modified dynamics is no different to this dynamics because the change of our, uh, our average volatility over time is actually, it's, it's, it's constant, so it's equal to zero. So we can just add that term in and then we can use the lag of the volatility process to calculate our, uh, our rate of mean reversion. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go ahead and look at the video last week. I'll put a link to it here. So I'm going to use our autoregressive model and um, we're going to be passing our data, so our volatility uh, standard deviation, and we're gonna have a one lag term. So we've got an autoregressive model with one lag term. We're gonna fit that and then we're going to look at the fit and then the parameter. And the rate of mean reversion of the volatility process that we get is 0.954 or thereabouts. So now the stochastic differential equation that we've completed is of this form here. Now in order to simulate this specific path, we would use a uh, Euler scheme approximation. For each month, this volatility uh, would be simulated as per this SDE. And then we would use that monthly volatility for a whole month um, of temperature simulations for each day within that month. And then you would progress from month to month. Now, the reason that I've done this on a monthly basis is just to show you a bit of variety um, of this model compared to another model where we might be able to get volatility per day in quite a... Um, well, a, a parametric way where we just feed in the, uh, the time and then we're gonna get a volatility back that's fixed. Now, it's important to note that we could actually fit a stochastic differential equation of this form for each individual month. Um, that would be a bit overkill for this exercise, but it could be done. Again, you can uh, vary your frequency of time that you want to assess these periods over um, as, as you wish. 
But hopefully that's given you five different ways that you can actually model volatility and then incorporate that within your modified ornstein ullenbeck process um, for temperature dynamics. Next episode, we're going to be using all these dynamics in our fitted temperature um, volatility models to be able to price weather derivatives in full. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, YouTube, see you later.